Okay, let's see where we're at in our book. Um, oh, we did Jiggery Pokery. Oh, all right. Today's chapter is chapter 20. It's the lovely, it's delightful, it's Des Moines? January 9th, 2004. Hey there, my vicarious fellow travelers. Have you ever seen those posters, A New Yorker's View of the World? They're these cartoony maps drawn from a New York perspective, and they go something like this. The East River, Lexington Avenue, Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue, Central Park, Columbus Avenue, Broadway, Riverside Drive, the Hudson River, New Jersey, the Midwest, Los Angeles, the Pacific Ocean, Asia, and finally disappearing over the horizon, Europe. And in some ways, that's really how we New Yorkers tend to see things. There's us, and then there are all those other little states and countries. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but <laughs> New York is the Celine Dion of cities. We find, we find ourselves completely fascinating. We love everything about ourselves and assume that everyone else does too. After all, we're New York. But, <laughs> but being on the road, visiting all these places I'd never planned to visit uh, has really made it hard to sustain that view because I've discovered to my complete shock, and you may want to sit down for this one, that many other U.S. cities actually have merit. Some of them even have, are you ready? Culture. Just between us, and please don't tell anyone I told you this, there seem to be a lot, lots of smart, funny, hip, talented, interesting people who don't live in Manhattan. Weird, huh? Go figure. Well, anyway, all of this has really put a crimp in my New York snobbery, and I'm none too happy about it. Des Moines, Iowa. I must reluctantly report, is a terrific town. It was rendered even more terrific by contrast with our last stop, Detroit. In fact, someone took to referring to Des Moines by the name Not Detroit, as in, isn't it nice to be here in good old Not Detroit? It's cold, but we're used to that now. I bought myself a real let's get down to business winter coat back at Filene's basement in Boston for just 85 bucks. Knee length, down filled, and made from the most synthetic materials available. It has an industrial grade zipper, an enormous hood, and enough pulls and snaps to drive any gloved man insane. I honestly think someone could swing a lead pipe at me in that thing, and I wouldn't feel it. Who knows, maybe somebody already did. I mean, we were in Detroit. I hitched a ride here with Maria, one of the moms, and her son Brandon, who's in the show. Brandon spent the whole drive in the back of the minivan watching DVDs and sleeping. Ah, to be nine again, what a life. We drove straight through the night. I think it was around four in the morning when I happened to glance up at the onboard thermometer. It read three. That's right, just three little degrees, just three. And the only thing separating us from the elements was this rolling metal box. As we pondered this, I thought about my friends back in L.A., how all happily snoring away in their nice warm beds as we barreled down that black highway in the dead of night in three-degree weather to get to our next stop. Poor fools, I thought. They don't know what they're missing. About 10 hours after leaving Detroit, we pulled up to the hotel in Des Moines, ready for hot showers and some real sleep. The hotel was every bit as nice as any at which we've stayed. Now, you've been traveling along with me, so by now, you all know what's important. And I can hear you asking, hey, Michael, does the bar serve food after the show? Why, yes, it does, thank you. They have a great late night menu served until midnight, and I was given a sprawling corner room where I could have easily given tennis lessons, and the theater was just down the block. Since we're doing mostly one-weekers at this point, that kind of proximity has become especially valuable. For the most part, you really don't want to have to learn your way around. 
Our audiences here have been warm and responsive, and here's the kicker, savvy. Des Moines gets all the Broadway tours, and they know what's good and what isn't. Yeah, that's right, they're theater people. Deal with that, New York. Fortunately, Les Mis still plays beautifully wherever we go and still has a powerful emotional effect, touching even the most sophisticated theater goers. And even after all these months, I still can't believe I'm fortunate enough to be in the cast. On opening night, we had an event in the lobby of the theater. The choir from a local high school performed a medley of highlights from Les Miserables. Okay, truthfully, I'm not sure how I feel about people hearing highlights from the show immediately before seeing it, especially because these rotten little bastards were brilliant. And there's just no call for that. I mean, why rub our noses in it, you know? Some of us sneaked into the lobby from backstage and hid around the corner to listen. Their diction alone put us to shame. And we had to follow these show-offs. Later in the week, I was scheduled to speak at their school. They sang their Les Miserables medley again, just for me, a private concert. I was supposed to give them pointers. I had nothing. They were so terrific that I, I had to make things up. And yet they gawked at me in wide-eyed wonder, absorbing my every comment as if I were Itzhak Perlman showing them how to hold a violin. As I've mentioned before in these reports, I really enjoy speaking to drama students and young aspiring actors. My hope is always that I can, one, dissuade some of them from pursuing this long shot of a profession, and two, encourage those who truly have the calling and can't be dissuaded. At the very least, I hope to give them a more realistic picture of what an acting career is like. I often have to remind myself that some of these kids don't know how difficult it is to make a living in the arts. Remember, I, I tell them, you rarely hear about actors who aren't working. Mostly, you only hear about the very famous ones and occasionally about blue-collar actors like me. And I was only invited to speak here today because I'm currently employed. The reality is that most professional actors are unemployed most of the time. It was a sobering thought, but it was a, a new one for many of them. I love the questions they come up with. How much money do you make? <laughs> the teachers are always more shocked at that one than I am. What would you do if you were in a show and they made you dress like a girl? For some reason, this is the scenario that most terrifies junior high school boys. They're not sure what to say when I tell them that I've done it. And enjoyed it. How do you get an agent? In Des Moines? Can I get your autograph? A sweet kid piped up. Of course, come on up here. And as I signed his program from the show, he added, you know, in case you ever make it. His teacher turned pale, but I wasn't insulted. He didn't mean anything by it. I gave him a big smile and I said, take a good look, friend, this is it. This is making it. I'm employed. Very few actors become stars. I'm grateful just to earn a living. And whenever and wherever I speak, I always include what I call my commercial, a reminder about theater etiquette, which is sadly a dying art. I'm not sure how it happened, but in recent years, the tradition seems to be eroding. People arrive late, they talk during the show, and sometimes worse. Once during Les Mis, a woman's cell phone rang right in the middle of the show's most tender moment as Jean Valjean was writing out his last confession. And she answered it. Her shocked fellow patrons then overheard, hello, at the show. Yeah, it's pretty good. A lot of singing. What? Well, he looks like he's about to die, so I should be home around 1130. So I try to gently educate people whenever I can, not only about the rules, but also about the reasons behind them. I explain, for example, that talking while the house lights are down isn't only a non-negotiable no-no, it's also not the best way to enjoy a show. It breaks the spell, I tell them. Like if you were having a great dream and someone shook you awake. I suggest that they get to the theater long before showtime and stay until the final curtain comes down, not only for the sake of etiquette, but also to get the fullest theater-going experience, the most bang for their buck, 
all the way from exploring the lobby to re and reading the program to thanking the performers at the end of the play. Walking out during the curtain call, I explain, is like dining out and not leaving a tip for the waiter a and might make the performers feel that you didn't like the show. I think people who aren't in theater are often surprised to learn that we can see and hear them from the stage. Actually, I must say that uh, I find theater students to be among the very best theater goers. They're involved, responsive, and into the experience. They dress up, they applaud generously. In fact, they're often among the diehards who will linger to till the end of the exit music, when most of the audience has already left, to applaud for the orchestra. They set an excellent example for the grown-ups. In spite of some of the serious content, my school visits tend to be casual, fun affairs. We chat about anything the kids can think of, and we always have a lot of laughs. Des Moines was no exception. Speaking of the orchestra, if you've ever had any doubt that, a show, that show people work hard, this item is for you. Larry Goldberg, our wonderful conductor who has been suffering with a herniated disc in his neck, will be staying behind in Des Moines to have it treated as the show continues on with a temporary replacement. He herniated his disc conducting. That's right. Most of us don't think of conducting as a physically taxing job, but it is. The repetition of those vigorous movements with the arms held high enough for both musicians and actors to see, and the intense concentration of coordinating the entire pit and the entire stage night after night does not make one's neck, back, and shoulders happy. And Les Miserables, you'll recall, is sung top to bottom. All music, all the time. So the one person who really doesn't get a break for those three hours straight is the conductor. He can never put his arms down. I say we make it an Olympic event. I'm sure it's a hell of a lot harder than some of those so-called sports like badminton or curling. Wouldn't that be hilarious? Blasenschmerz really needs to come through in these last few bars to make up for that Botchkirch Sando section earlier in the piece, Dave. That's right, Jim. This is white knuckle conducting if ever I've seen it. The Polish judge is particularly tough when it comes to cadenzas, but Blasenschmerz is showing no sign of strain as he rounds the bend into the coda. Well, he's been in training, and I think that shows. Now, that's a sport I'd watch. Les Miserables isn't the only caravan in Des Moines this week. The Democratic presidential candidates are also here. We keep hoping to spot one, but that, it hasn't happened yet. Though we did see a well-known newscaster at the bar. I suspect we keep very different hours. But it's wild to think that they're all here. Dean, Kerry, Edwards, Sharpton, all of them. And there's something so, I don't know, Fellini about the convergence of our two camps. Maybe it amuses me because of the sharp contrast. These guys are trying to become the friggin' president of the United States, you know? They're dealing with real, crucial, life-and-death, world-affecting issues. We're putting on funny clothes and singing, and yet, somehow, we all landed in Des Moines. Lately, I've been hanging out with a great fellow cast member, Pierce Brandt. He plays the frisky factory foreman who fires the fragile Fontaine. Pierce is a very smart guy and extremely gifted with language, which always skyrockets someone to the top of my list. We had lunch one day and then took a nice, chilly walk around town. As we crossed a bridge over a frozen river, something very natural and instinctive happened. We turned into little boys. Check it out. Cool. Hey, let's climb down and look at it. Yeah. We climbed down to the riverbank and studied, studied the thin layer of ice. As is the male custom, we debated and exchanged theories on matters such as the thickness of the ice, the depth of the river, and how long it might take you to die if you were to fall in. And then we did what little boys do. Let's see if we can break it. Yeah, I'll get a stick. That stick's no good. Here's a good stick. And, <laughs> and that was our fun for the afternoon. Here we are big successful grown-up working actors in a Broadway tour, but show us a frozen river and we're kids again. These one-weekers do tend to fly by. Feels like we just got here and already it's time to start packing again. On Monday, we'll bus to Greenville, North Carolina, where no doubt there will be new stories to tell. 
Greenville, I hear, is a, a happening college town with lots to see and do. Still, I'm sure it's no Des Moines. Stay in touch. Kostroff. Well, I know there are a lot of edits in this one because I kept making mistakes and uh, <laughs> tripping over my tongue. But uh, there you have it, Des Moines. Uh, next up is one of my favorite chapters. So there's a little teaser for you. I will see you then. Take care.